Good morning. Welcome to worship at Libertyville Covenant Church once again. This is one of those wonderful mornings when we get a chance to sing our songs and lift our prayers and share in the table together. Worship is not what we're doing here and you're watching on a screen. Worship is something that you and us are all doing together. The word for worship, liturgy, literally translates as the work of the people. And so our prayer for you this time is that this isn't just one more thing to watch, but rather it's something to do, it's something to engage in. So I want to encourage you today to sing the songs, to uh, be in the responses together with us, and to engage as much as you can with the Holy Spirit uh, in worship itself. To help you with that, we have a few things uh, to prep with. You should have gotten an email with the bulletin and another email uh, from the children's ministry to help you prepare for this service. A few things you're going to need for the children's message specifically, you're going to need a gallon of milk, water, whatever it may be, and a can. The kids are going to be using these uh, when they talk with Heather during the children's message. For us, uh, as we continue to worship, uh, I encourage you to have a Bible handy, whether that's on your computer, your phone, or uh, one of those old paper kinds next to you, because we'll be digging into the Word again, and, and you'll need to have that open. I encourage you to have paper and a pencil so you can take notes, so that you can jot ideas or draw or whatever helps you to focus and uh, reflect on what we're talking about. But also with that, today, as I said, is uh, Communion Sunday. And so I encourage you, if you haven't already, to get some bread and some juice, wine, whatever it may be. And later in the service, we're going to help lead you in your homes through communion itself. We'll talk more about that as we go. The chat bar is always available for greetings. I encourage you right now, not later on, but right now, to begin sharing prayer requests you might have in the chat bar. And during our prayer time, we'll leave some empty space for you to lift those prayers that you see in the chat bar uh, up to God together. We hope that this is a time for us to worship together, for us to engage, and for us to know God's Holy Spirit and grow. So let's join together with the call to worship. For our call to worship, I'd love to invite you to respond as I will lead and invite you to respond with our responses that begin with, we have come to worship or we have come to worship uh, and following each section. Let us join together. Through the word and through the bread, we have have come come to to worship worship God this morning. Many things try to draw us away, but we have come to worship God this morning. We gather from around the world for just one purpose. We have come to worship God this morning. Let us pray. Brightness of God's glory, an exact image of God's person, whom death could not conquer, nor the tomb in prison, as you have shared our frailty in human flesh. Help us to share your immortality in the Spirit. Let no shadow of the grave terrify us, and no fear of darkness turn our hearts from you. Reveal yourself to us this day, and all our days, as the first and last, the living one, our mortal Savior and Lord. Amen. As God has greeted us with his peace, so let us pass the peace of Christ with one another, not only in your own homes, but also in the chat bar. Let us share the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Today, as we sing our songs, uh, we are remembering our theme for the morning, which is First Peter. As you know, we've been talking about uh, Peter's call to us to imitate Christ, to imitate God, to be holy as he is holy. So today we're going to be singing I Will Follow, which is a song all about imitating Christ. And then our second song uh, helps us to worship and remember the one that we are following. So let's sing together. I will trust in you alone, higher than my sight, high above my life. I will trust in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you 
too long, night into my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I seek, knowing I will find. All I need is you alone, is you alone. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Great. 
great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my talked about two weeks ago about imitating Christ, being a copycat. I don't know if you remember, but Pastor Paul and I were, he copied me. We tried to mirror each other. And then last week, we talked about yielding, right? Remembering to put others first and then ourselves. Put Christ and others first. Well, you know, all of this, there's been a lot of activity in that, whether that was playing copycat or whether that was uh, last week we played Simon Says, remember? Uh, We're going to keep being active because 1 Peter is about action, actually. It's about doing good. So we're going to do some more activities today, and hopefully, even though you're at home, um, you can still stay active spiritually and, of course, physically as well. So let's talk about this, about doing good. I want you to take a few seconds and think about three things that you can do or maybe that you have done that are good and then share them with someone else that's with you there at home or, if you'd like, on the Google chat. All right, so some of those things. I asked some, some people here, you know, and at my own house, what are some things that we've done good? Um, some things like sharing toys. That's a good thing. Uh, maybe playing with a brother or sister, even though maybe you don't want to, or maybe there's a lot of other things that you could do instead, but you're choosing to still be with them and play with them. Maybe it's something like praying for others, or maybe writing someone a note or calling them to say hi. And those are all things that would be good, that are also in some ways imitating Christ, all right, and yielding to others. But, you know, life is not that easy. There's things that happen. You know, for instance, right now, we can't go outside and play with our friends. That's really rough, right? And you know what? Sometimes I just don't want to do what I'm told. You know, moms ask me to clean my room, and I really honestly don't want to do it today. (sighs) You know what? My brother and sister, they haven't been really nice to me today. I mean, I know I'm supposed to be nice, but they really haven't haven't played with me. They haven't shared with me. Maybe they even punched me or pinched me today. (sighs) You know what? kind of afraid of all this going on right now. And maybe even a little worried. What's going to be happening in June? 
speaking to us adults there a little bit. And last but not least, it's been a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Well, now this bucket's full of those things. Oh, oh my lands. This is about as far as I can lift it. But Christ has asked me to do good. What? What? I mean, I have to do good even though this is so heavy? (sighs) That's crazy. You know what? No, we're not alone. Paul tells us in Philippians 4.13 that I can do all this, all things, through Christ who strengthens me. Repeat that after me. I can do all this, all things, with Christ who strengthens me. We are not alone. We are not alone. It doesn't matter if we had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. It doesn't matter if maybe we're afraid or we're worried or maybe somebody didn't treat us very well today. (sighs) Because with Christ, we can do it. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do at home this week. This is where the physical activity comes in for you. Granted, you could try this at home. I suggest, though, that you maybe do it with a parent, because I'm telling you, even at my age, this is really hard to lift. So here's what I'd like you to do, just to practice this. I'd like you to either grab a can, any can that you have at home, all right? Or if you maybe have an empty jug, could be an orange juice jug or a milk jug, all right? And if it is a jug, I'd like you to fill it with water. In fact, you know what? This reminds me of my grandma uh, during World War II where they, when they didn't have much supplies. My grandma used to fill these with water, and she would exercise all the time. So this is another good way to make a homemade weight. So basically what I want you to do is find something that you can use as a weight. And then this week, each day, I want you to take your weight and spend some time, some time, and sometimes, yes, doing some bicep curls. But while you do this, I want you to be reciting Philippians 4.13. I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. So this week, guys, let's get even more physical. Let's lift some weights. Remembering that, yes, doing good can be hard work. But with Christ, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I will say one last thing. We would love to have pictures of you. Pictures of you using your weights and reciting verses. Maybe even pictures of you imitating Christ in another way, doing good. Maybe it's the picture of the yield sign you made last week. All right? Are you copycatting a brother or sister? Any of those. We'd love to have those pictures. Please send them in. But you know what? Before you go, I have to get this out of the way. And, you know, we are honestly all in this together. Believe it or not. We have each other. So, Pastor Steve, could you please help me move this bucket? Okay. Thank you. Peace. Do good. I want to remind us as we've gathered this morning that Pastor Steve said at the very beginning of our time that we've gathered that we want to invite your prayers and that they be made known not just uh, for those in the chat bar, but before God. And we lift those up at this point in our worship service. And so maybe you had a chance to write them down in the, in the chat bar, and maybe you would like to do them now. I'd like to invite you to bring whatever it is on your heart. Make sure you're reminded that it will be public, it will be on the chat bar. But I invite you to join me as we pray this morning. Let us pray. Christ our Lord, Long ago in Galilee, many who were sick and suffering needed friends to bring them to your side. Confident of your goodness, we now bring to you those who need your healing touch. We name before you those who are ill in body, whose illness is long or painful or difficult to cure those who suffer restless days and sleepless nights. Jesus Christ, why don't you bring your healing? We name before you those who are troubled in mind, 
distressed by the past or dreading the future, those who are trapped and cast down by fear. Oh Lord, won't you bring healing and bringing peace? We name before you those who mourn light, those whom light has turned to darkness by the death of a loved one, the breaking of a friendship, or the fading of hope. God, might we be mindful of the hope that comes each morning. Jesus Christ, lover of all, we pray that you bring your healing and bring your peace. We ask your guidance for those who are engaged in the medical research, that they may persevere with vision and energy, and for those who administer agencies of health and welfare, that they may have wisdom and compassion. Jesus, we come to you knowing we can do all things through you and your strength. God, might we look around this morning and see the flowers blossoming and blooming, for we see new buds poking their heads out this morning. Lord, we thank you for times with family, reasons for laughter and communion together. God, might we not miss those opportunities that are afresh today. Lord, we thank you for the air we breathe. For the gentle drizzle and rain that's come down this week, we give thanks. Lord, won't you make us mindful of the needs of others that surround us, while also, Lord, might we bring our needs before you. God, it's so good to know that you care to hear from us. God, for the prayers that we've named this morning, we are mindful of the things that we have done that are less than pleasing. Before you, Lord, we confess we are in need of your forgiveness and grace. There might we be people that bring our sin before you and have that washed clean, that we may not need to carry that any longer like extra baggage, unneeded on a journey. Lord, as we continue in bringing our praise and prayer, God, we know that you're an awesome God, a loving God, a compassionate creator, sustainer, provider, and redeemer, and friend. God, we pause now that we may lift our prayers up wherever we may be to you. And we pray that you hear our prayers. God, we raise our voices together, praying a prayer you had taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, everybody. This song is called Stand on the Rock. And as we've been studying First Peter for a while, who is the rock, uh, we acknowledge that uh, Peter is not the rock on which we stand as Christians, but rather uh, it is Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, that Peter points us to. So this is a song full of scripture called Stand on the Rock. I hope it blesses you today. Rejoicing came in the morning. 
I'm free, now I'm laughing For the joy he gave me Every nation will sing God has done great things We'll go out with weeping But come back singing songs of joy What a glorious day, day by day He's my savior, I know. Arose from the grave, that's how he saved my soul. I know Jesus, he died, but he lives inside of me, and I will stand on the rock. Oh, oh I will stand on the rock, yeah. Oh, I, I will stand on the rock. He's my savior, I know. Arose from the grave, that's how he saved my soul. I know Jesus, he died, but he lives inside of me. Pastor Steve, that was wonderful to hear you uh, sing of God's praises and standing on the rock. With thankfulness, we give in gratitude and joy. With prayerfulness, we give in sacrifice and love. With hopefulness, we give in commitment to God. With joy, we offer our gifts to God as a sign of our deep devotion and covenant faithfulness. Each of you in I are invited in our own way to give of ourselves and, and all that God has given in unique and different ways. And yet in this time of worship, we are invited to give of ourselves in one way or another, stewarding the many gifts, the many, many gifts that God has asked to, to be brought before him. I'd like to invite you now to, to look at our website, libcov.org, L-I-B-C-O-V dot O-R-G. And if you would look up at the tab at the top called Give, click on that as we invite you, as you feel led by God and encouraged to participate in the ministry and the life of our church, give uh, as, as God has invited us to give freely and joyfully. As we give, we're invited to also sing of God's praises. And let us join our voices together as we sing the doxology together. Won't you join me at this time? God of extravagant mercy, with hands outstretched, you have poured out wonder and pleasure and delight, goodness and beauty and bounty. So take these offerings, we pray, as a protest against all that is evil and ugly and impoverished, trivial and wretched and tyrannical in our world and in ourselves. Thus may we and others know ourselves to be blessed. Might your kingdom come. Might it be furthered with these gifts in your hands. Amen. Let us continue as we sing together.
first reading today is from Psalm chapter 37, verses 1 to 4. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Our second reading today is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 18. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak to you maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Thanks be to God. It was a cold night in Chicago. It was 1995. I was in my second year of seminary and watching the news. The reporter was saying that the bitterness of the cold of that snowy night could very well mean homeless people would die this night. That struck a chord with me and I wandered over to the closet. I opened the door and looked at the second shelf and found four blankets I didn't even know we had. I looked at those blankets and then wandered over to the window to watch the horizontal driven snow driving past my warm face. And as I stood there, I fought. I fought two urges inside of me. I could take those four blankets that I didn't need and didn't even know that I'd had. I could drive five minutes from my apartment and easily find homeless people and give them the blankets and possibly even save their lives. Or I could stay safe in my warm apartment and not brave the cold of a Chicago evening. There was no question in my mind of what God wanted me to do. This wasn't a theological debate by any means. It was quite clear. And so I prayed, and I cried, and I despaired, and I put those blankets back away, and I went to bed. I prayed as I laid there for the homeless. I prayed for their safety and for their peace, and I prayed for forgiveness. For the next week, I couldn't stop hearing the words of James 2.15 running through my head over and over again. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. The good news of that night is that I was forgiven 
And I have been living out that forgiveness ever since. The bad news is that it's still really hard to do good. That's what we're going to be looking at today as we look at this third chapter of the book of 1 Peter. So I'd encourage you to grab your Bibles. Uh, If they're on your screen or on your phone, go ahead and turn to them. If they're uh, in your Bible itself, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to start a little ways into it, but before we begin, and as you're turning, uh, let's pray for a moment. God, our Heavenly Father, speak to us today. Speak to us, Lord, about what it is to let our salvation, the free gift that you've given to us, play out in good deeds in our lives. Speak, Lord, for we are listening. In your name we pray, amen. Peter has been telling us so far in this book why we should do good. He's given us one answer in each of the first two chapters. Do you remember what they were? See if you can come up with them. See if you can remember what were the reasons for doing good in chapter 1 and chapter 2. You got them? Remember in chapter 1, Peter says we should be good in imitation of Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 15. As disciples, as those who have taken on the task of discipleship, we follow Jesus, we imitate Jesus, we walk and we talk and we think and we see the world like Jesus. That's what it is to be a disciple. I worked in youth ministry for a number of years and uh, worked in one of my churches with a fellow youth pastor. And so the two of us would talk often, and he had this thing he would tell his kids that I found quite disturbing till I really started thinking about it. They would always come to him and they'd they'd say, Pastor, we don't want to do the things you keep telling us we're supposed to do. We want to lie. We want to cheat on our tests. We want to sleep around. We want to do these things. And he would tell them, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to obey Jesus. He'd say, you can lie and you can cheat and you can gossip and you can sleep around all you want. You just can't do these things and still claim to be following Jesus. If you follow Christ, then we don't do those things. And if we do those things, then we have to ask, are we truly following Christ? This is discipleship, to imitate Christ in every circumstance, in every moment, in everything that we do. We're forgiven when we fail. Because we all fail to be like Christ again and again. But in order to fail, first we have to try. If we're not even trying to be like Christ, we have to ask ourselves whether we actually are disciples or not. Chapter 1, be good in imitation of Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, be good as a witness to the society around us. Chapter 2, verse 12. When people look at us as disciples, they should see something different than when they look at people who are not disciples. They should see a few different things. They should see us going into danger, relational or physical danger, out of love for other people. I was looking at this uh, this week, and I found some interesting uh, statistics about Christians, or at least quotes, whether that, that danger was malaria or plague or leprosy. Christians have historically distinguished themselves by going into danger to care for those who are left behind by society. Cyprian is quoted as saying to his fellow Christians during the plague of the third century, saying of his fellow Christians, we have begun gladly to seek martyrdom while we are learning not to fear death. When people look at us as Christians, they should see us going into danger, relational or physical, out of love for others. They should see us spreading peace and hope with every word, not fear, not despair. They should see us giving up the things that they normally would do or cling to for the sake of Jesus Christ. And when they do see that, Peter says, quoting Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, they will see your good deeds and give glory to God. 
two very good reasons Peter gives us to do good. But today we have to ask, what exactly is doing good? Doing good is the ethical, behavioral side of our faith, but it's not the whole of our faith. Christianity is not just a behavioral modification system. Christianity is a relationship with all that relationship entails. But in terms of behavior, Peter has already started giving us his ethics list. We all have them. It's not bad to have one. In fact, we need one. We need to have a list going in our head of the things we should do and the things we should not do. Peter's ethics list, if you remember, looks like this. We should be holy as he is holy. We should love others from the heart. Remember, with loyalty and emotion and passion. We should crave spiritual milk. We should live good lives. And on the other side, what are the things we shouldn't take part in or be a part of? Malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. We should not, he says, live out our sinful desires. So far, this list has been almost solely about how Christians should relate to secular society and neighbors. Be holy, he says. Live differently than those around you. That's what holy means, is separate, set apart, different from anything else. Live good lives as a witness to them. Don't hate and lie and envy and slander our non-Christian neighbors, because when we do, it absolutely kills our witness. Instead, as we said last week with Heather's yield sign, we should submit, we should yield to them because Jesus did and because our world doesn't. We should submit to others because Jesus did and because our world doesn't so we can witness through it. Christians to secular governments we talked about, Christians to non-Christian bosses and masters and husbands and wives. Now we begin to get into fir- to chapter 3 of First Peter, however. And Peter wraps up his ethic by talking about both secular society and our Christian brothers and sisters. How should we interact with those two groups? Take a look at verse 8 with me. We're going to not look at the first seven simply because they're really part of chapter 2. They're the, the last part of who we submit to. So we're going to start at chapter 8 and move on. He begins with some interesting Phrases, finally, all of you, all of who? Finally, all of who? Who is Peter speaking to? Who is Peter's audience? If you remember, we talked a few weeks ago and then again last week about the fact that Peter's audience were Gentiles who lived in these cities and then found themselves attracted to the synagogue, to the Jewish teachings about God. So they attached themselves to the synagogue and became part of it. But then when Christianity came to town, they realized it was the fulfillment of their Jewish beliefs so far, and so they attached themselves onto the Christian church, this small group of believers. The church at that time, around 60, 65 AD, was being heavily persecuted. It was being persecuted far and wide, so joining the church means running toward persecution. And yet they did. But as part of a persecuted community, Peter gives them this ethic. He says a few things. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, sympathetic, love one another. We've heard that one before. Be compassionate and humble. This is what I would call Peter's behavioral covenant for his church because this is him talking about people within the body of Christ. As a member of the Central Conference Executive uh, Board, recently we looked once again at our behavioral covenant and reaffirmed it and signed it again. A behavioral covenant is simply a document spelling out how we will treat one another. You form a behavioral covenant when things are good because when things get uh, contentious or difficult or angry or emotional, it's important to have those behavioral covenants handy so you can say, wait, this is how we want to behave even though I really want to wring your neck. Peter's 
behavioral covenant for his church is quite simple. Toward other individuals, love and compassion. Toward yourself, humility. Toward the group as a whole, like-mindedness. And then he goes on in verse 9. He says, don't repay evil for evil. Okay, at this point, we assume that Peter has now shifted to secular society and is not saying, within the church, when people do evil to you, don't repay them. I certainly hope there isn't evil going on in the church. Obviously, Peter has shifted away from this, so he's now talking to, the secu- to people about how to deal with secular society. He says, don't get even, which is the way of the world, isn't it? If you do this to me, I do it back to you. In fact, if you do this to me, oftentimes I do worse to you. In the Old Testament, they had a rule that God set for them, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. What that meant was not you should go get even, but rather when you get even because that's your natural proclivity, don't do any more than what they did to you. Because if you think about it, someone you know bumps someone walking down the street. That person shoves them. That person turns around and hits them. That person attacks them. Pretty soon that person kills the first one. Well, now the family of the other one has to get revenge, and it just keeps escalating. You can't be in society that way. So when God said in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, what he meant was no more than that. And then Jesus changed that ethic and said, I've heard, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I tell you, love those who persecute you. So we find here, don't repay evil for evil. Don't get even with people, but instead be good regardless. Peter assumes that they're going to face evil. They're going to face insult from the society around them. And in fact, as I said, they were facing that very thing. If you remember, we talked about uh, Peter saying that you should submit to the emperor. The emperor of that day was Nero, an emperor famous, infamous, notorious for his persecution of Christians. But once again, passing along Jesus' teachings... Jesus, who said, turn the other cheek and walk the extra mile with those who demand it of you. Peter comes and says, you should do good regardless. Why? Why should we do good when no one else is? Witness, holiness, ethics. Always be ready, Peter says, to give an answer to those who ask you why you have hope. Now, this assumes that people will ask, which assumes that they see something different in you. They see you behaving differently than the rest of the world. Otherwise, they'll never ask in the first place. When I was in high school, let me backtrack. One more story. These are a lot of stories about me. I apologize. It's just what happened this week. But when I was in high school, um, I would eat lunch in our choir director's office. Um, a lot of kids were in the cafeteria, but I was older and I just kind of wanted some time on my own. So I'm sitting in the choir director's office, eating my lunch and working on some homework when in walked Jenny. Jenny walked in and sat down next to me and said, Steve, why do you smile all the time? I hadn't even noticed that I smiled all the time. That was not something I was doing intentionally, but I guess I did. And in that moment, the spirit kind of grabbed a hold of me. Ever have those moments where you just know exactly what to say? I don't have them often. Most of the time, I feel pretty tongue-tied when people ask me off-the-cuff questions like that, especially in high school when it was girls. But she asked, why are you smiling all the time? And I just turned to her and I said, because I know Jesus. And she said, tell me about that. And I had a chance to talk to her about Jesus. I don't know whatever happened to that. I don't have great stories that she came to know Christ or joined the youth group or began leading Bible studies. I don't know what came of Jenny. But I do know that with a simple smile, she noticed something different and gave me an opportunity to tell her about Jesus. We need to be different than the society around us. Evil and insults unavenged. Persecution unfought. Suffering born with hope. This is Peter's ethic passed on to him from Jesus himself. 
And honestly, it's almost impossibly hard. Doing good, as Heather talked to us earlier about, is almost impossibly hard. Because every day we are going to face things that attempt to keep us from being good. Sometimes it's big things like persecution or suffering inflicted when we follow Jesus. Suffering and persecution that could stop if we just stopped being good. But sometimes, like on that cold night in Chicago, it's quite simply comfort or laziness or better options that keep us from doing good. It can be social shunning or even shaming in our culture. It can be danger, real or imagined. Or it could be privilege that keeps us from doing good as Peter and Jesus define it. So I ask you today, what are the things that hold you back from fully committing to Jesus' ethic in your life? Last week, we talked a little bit about the Wesleyan quadrilateral. If you remember that, it's Wesley's idea that there's four things that we use when we make ethical theological decisions. Those four things are scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. And we spelled that out last week. So if you want to know more about it, go ahead and look at last week's sermon. But I want to think today about those four things because while each of these can help us to make ethical decisions, each of those things can also keep us from doing good. That's kind of hard to wrap your brain around, so let me give you some quick examples. Reason can keep us from doing good. Have you ever thought yourself out of doing the right thing? Ever had things come to your head like, well, that doesn't make any sense, or the consequences are simply too great? How about experience? Have you ever let your own past experiences keep you from doing good in the moment? Things like, I did that, and I just got hurt. Or, I did something, and I saw others pay the price for what they did. Tradition. Ever find yourself saying, yeah, but we just haven't ever done it that way before. That's when tradition can step in and keep us from doing the good. Now for the hard one, Scripture. Scripture can keep us from doing good. Ever found yourself looking to use one scripture verse out of context to keep from being like Jesus? Well, in the Old Testament, it says this one thing one time, and therefore, I shouldn't do all the things that I saw Jesus doing. We never quite put it like that. But even scripture, even a shallow reading of scripture can lead us and keep us from not doing good. We can honestly, as human beings, use almost anything to keep from being like Jesus. We are infinitely creative, especially in this place. Because being good, being like Christ, is really, really hard. So let me ask you one more time. What keeps you from imitating Jesus? What keeps you from living your life so differently from all of your neighbors and your friends that they notice and ask you about it. Not just once, but over and over and over again. For Peter's churches, what they were facing was persecution and suffering. For us, it may be any of a number of things we've already talked about. But the fact is that being good is hard. And so, being good, being like Christ in the midst of any society, takes a lot of work. It takes constant, disciplined, work. Remember back in chapter 1 when Peter used that image that we kind of translated as rolling up the sleeves of your mind? Peter actually uses this image of the mind girding its loins. Whenever in that day, because they wore tunics that were kind of like dresses, whenever they needed to do some really serious lifting, some really hard work, they would take their dress and pull it up and tuck it in their belt. They called it girding their loins. It meant you were about to do something really hard. For us today, we would call it rolling up your sleeves. That's where we get that phrase. To do good means we have to roll up our sleeves because this won't be easy. So are you willing to let your soul put on its work clothes 
roll up its sleeves and dig into this hard task of being like Christ? Not because God won't love you if you don't. That's not what this is about. We have to remember all of this flowed in chapter 1 out of the salvation we've already received as this free gift. So it's not about earning our God's love or that God will be mad at us, but rather we do this because we love Jesus enough to pit it, put in the work of imitating him and living his life as a witness around us. This is discipleship. And discipleship is not for the faint of heart. It's why Jesus said we have to count the cost before we dig in, because this won't be easy. Discipleship is not for the faint of heart. Discipleship is not for the lazy. And discipleship is not for the overly comfortable. So let me close with this. What aspect of Jesus' life, his way of living, is hardest for you to imitate? What piece of who Jesus was is hardest for you to imitate? I want you to tell somebody you're sitting with, or even if you dare, put it in the chat bar. A lot of times there's lag as we go, so these may show up later on in our service, but if you're willing, put it in the chat bar. What's the hardest aspect of Jesus' character for us to imitate? And then let me challenge you this week. We haven't had a challenge recently. So let me challenge you this. Could you make it your goal this week to be like Jesus in that particular area of your life? Whatever's the most challenging, try just that one first. If that's too much, maybe try a slightly easier one. But we are called to be like Christ, to imitate Jesus as a witness to the world that they might see our good deeds and give glory to God in heaven because that is what it's all about. Would you pray with me? God, help us today because being good is so hard. Lord, God, help us to live our lives different than the community around us, more Christ-like, more compassionate, more forgiving, more accepting, more loving. Lord, God, help what sets us apart not to be that we are more judgmental or more pharisaical or more self-righteous, but rather, Lord, that we are more like you. And in so doing, may they bring you glory because of our good deeds. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we prepare for the table, which I want to encourage you now, uh, you should have gotten a lot of notes earlier this week about preparing bread and a cup of some kind, whether that's wine or juice or whatever you're using. I want to encourage you to go get that and put it together uh, because we're going to be sharing communion together in a moment. But first, let's sing together.
As we come to the table today, as we did last month, we do so virtually, which is a new experience for most of us. I'm not sure how many of us have taken communion online, so to speak. But as I said last month, I believe this would make Jesus smile. Because you see, in the Last Supper, when Jesus um, used the elements of the Seder meal, he was hearkening back to the Old Testament, to a meal that all Jews had celebrated and still do celebrate once a year, the Seder, remembering the Passover, remembering their salvation from Egypt. In that Seder meal, everyone celebrated that meal in their own homes with the head of the household serving the rest. And so today, as we do that exact same thing by celebrating the holy, um, the table, we're going to be doing the exact same thing that has been going on for centuries, even millennia. Today, uh, I encourage you to get those elements ready because we'll be taking part together in them. We'll give you some instructions in just a little bit. It's now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire his help that they may lead a holy life. All who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them. All who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life. Found the commandments of God and walking from now on in his holy ways are invited to draw near with faith and to receive this holy sacrament. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Many will come from east and west, from north and south, to sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast that he has prepared. According to Luke, When our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are righteous, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come, not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your frailty and sin, you stand in constant need of God's mercy and help. Come, not to express an opinion, but to seek God's presence and pray for the Spirit. It's fitting that we uh, share together in a prayer of confession and then hear once again the words of assurance. And so I'd like to lead us in that prayer. Let's pray together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not imitated Christ. And oftentimes we have not been truly good as you define it. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Might you hear these words of assurance, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May God have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul, who says that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread. 
And having given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray together. Lord God, through such simple things as bread and juice or wine, Lord, you bring such spiritual truth to our lives. So Lord, we pray that you would bless these elements here in our homes and through them that you would bless us so that through us, we might bless the world around us, that they might see our good deeds and give glory to you in heaven. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. In the same way is not the cup that we bless a participation in the blood of Christ. We all celebrate in our own homes apart from each other right now, and yet we take part in the one loaf. As a sign of our unity together in this moment, we are still the church of God. And so as we share We have to think of sharing together with the whole church, even if we're not in their immediate presence today. There's a number of different ways that you can do communion at your home. You can break off pieces yourself and have them available with separate cups for everyone there. If you would prefer, you can have one loaf and do it by what's called intinction, which means each person tears off some of the bread, dips it into the cup, and then takes part. However you choose to do it at your home, You go right ahead and do that. Whoever's head of the household can serve. The one piece that we ask out of faithfulness to Jesus Christ and the deep meaning of this sacrament, we ask that if you are not in a place in your spiritual journey where you honor and follow Jesus as Christ, we ask that you simply let the elements pass. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, whether you're part of our church or not, we invite you to take part in communion together. So we're going to give you a few minutes to share the elements together in communion. Then we'll come back together again to finish our service. Su Yi is going to be playing Be Thou My Vision. That song has become a bit of a theme song for this series. And so we're incorporating that song into our worship every week as we study First Peter. For it's a song that talks about imitating Christ. Christ, be my vision. And so as she plays now, we invite you to take part in your homes in the elements. Let's worship together.
as we close our service today, we just want to remind you that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, as Heather told us earlier. Whether that's lifting a gallon of milk, whether that's being surprisingly patient and kind to those in your homes when we're all together in one place for a long time, whether that's caring for your neighbors through a phone call, or whether that's delivering groceries to people who can't get out themselves, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So let's go and be good in this world today that others might notice it and not give praise to us, but give glory to God in heaven. As you go from this place, go as people who are forgiven, who are saved, who are disciples, and go and be good. Be Christ to God's glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.